Hi, this is Michelle Dale for BA Live and welcome um, to this interview. I've got a very honoured guest here um, who's had all sorts of uh, amazing comments from people like Jeff Walker and things about his entrepreneurship and, and what he's doing. His name is Dane Maxwell and he is head honcho of The Foundation, which is at thefoundation.io and they're a badass tribe of entrepreneurs building lucrative software companies. Badass, I love that. Okay, so welcome, Dane. Nice to see you. Yeah, thanks. Nice to see you too. Um, this is the first time that we've actually been talking, the first time that we met, but I know loads about you. I feel like I know you already. Um, and basically, I've got you on the call today because you're a software guy. You, you know about software. You know how to sell it. You know how to make money from it. And for anybody who is listening to this call, they're probably wondering, Michelle, why are you getting into software? You're a service provider, and I know, it's crazy, right? But I've been looking at what you're doing, and I'm thinking to myself that this software thing is pretty lucrative. And not only that, the way that um, Dane puts it out on his website, it also seems, you know, pretty sort of smooth to get into. So this is what we want to talk about today with Dane. We want to talk about software. We want to talk about how service providers can use it. Um, we also want to talk about the foundation, which is what Dane has been doing. So, Dane, first of all, if you don't mind telling us a bit about the foundation and what it is and, and why you kind of founded it. Sure, but first you forgot to you forgot to announce Winnie. Oh, hi! Oh my God, is that Linny? Cute. Winnie. Hi. So maybe <laughs> she, we can she, do a little. Like, Post interview afterwards with the dog. <laughs> <laughs> She's my companion during the day. Does she do any tricks? <laughs> so you, she, I get her. I can get her to do the up thing, and then I'm working on getting her to dance around. Thanks to Andy. Oh great, that's awesome. So I'm not deflecting your question. You uh, would like to know about the foundation. And before I get into the foundation, I do want to talk about the, the service industry because a lot of people get into the service industry because that's the way they think that's one of the better ways to make money. Um, they, they take a skill that they have and they figure out how to make money with it. Um, so if, if you're in the service industry and you have this belief that you need to have a skill in order to make money, um, th this, is, this is why you're in the service industry. Um, now, I don't have really any particular skills that people would pay for. Um, and, and said, instead, I hire experts with skills for, for me. Mm. Um, and, and so this is a really big mindset shift that uh, if you're in the service space that you're going to need to think about considering if you want to, to get out of the service industry um, or, 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 supplement, or supplement your income as a consultant or, or service provider. Um, all, all the things that... Uh, I know I have many examples I can talk about of people who are in the service space who really just ended up getting really sick and tired of dealing with pain in the ass clients who, who um, you know, want to go back and forth, who don't pay your bills on time, who you have to deal with, and then you got to go out and find more clients. If you kind of to get away from all of that, which a lot of people I talk to in the service space actually want to, um, the software is a good option. If you're totally passionate about service and you just love what you do, but you'd like to expand your income, the framework that we explain, you can use to, I think, potentially double the amount of income you're making without even actually adding software at all. Um, but but just, add, by just by just applying the framework that we use to actually create software to expand your product line in, in areas that might not be software. Does that all make sense? Yeah, so what you're saying is you can take this software model and apply it to your service business. Yes. Wow, okay. So how does that work? Well, the software model is all built on the principles of a freedom-based business, which are an automated sale, mm -hmm. uh, reoccurring monthly revenue, no accounts receivable, meaning you get paid in advance, and that you're selling tools and shovels instead of digging for gold. And um, if you look back to the gold rush, the guys that made the most money in the gold rush was uh, Levi Strauss, the guy selling jeans, and then also the guy selling the picks and the shovels. They made far more money than the guys actually mining for gold. So these are the four principles that you want to, to implement into your service business if you'd like to start shifting towards more, uh, more income with less of your personal time. Awesome. So, yes. So, examples on how to do that, or, or go ahead. Yeah, no, go on. I was going to ask you for examples. <laughs> oh, perfect. <Shoot. laughs> wow. Yes, great minds think alike. 
So examples, um, gosh, you know, I don't actually know any uh, good examples because I don't really know those people, service people anymore because they just completely end up getting out of service after they talk to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I, would, what I would recommend if you're a service professional is um, start figuring out how you can automate your sales so that you look, you log into your bank account and you see more money there and you're like, oh my gosh, I have more money. What happened? Oh, I must have had a sale. That's how automated it could be. And then you go into your email and you're like, oh, look at that. There's three new clients that have already paid me and they want to work with me. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the same mind that we use about software, about getting people to pay in advance for a product you can use to sell a service in advance. Yeah, and definitely. this this uses a copywriting. This mm. all comes down to copywriting. So it's more about packaging what you're selling and and taking the money in advance for it. And I yes. suppose I mean the way software is evolving at the moment. I mean I know this from myself because I I work with clients, but I work completely online, and um, I also have a team of people around me. So I have uh, service providers who work with me. So we're kind of reliant completely on software uh we need software to interact with our clients we need software to be able to process any kind of work that we're doing so it's a massive part of of our lives and this is honestly the first time where i've ever thought to myself that it could be you know an actual income stream um in terms of you know providing software to clients but where where would you start with that? I mean, it's like we don't know anything about software. We're not developers. We we don't have any ideas as to what we're going to offer. Where do you start? Oh wow! I just realized that um, most of my financial freedom comes from selling software to service providers. <laughs> and <laughs> so you're trying to sort of... get rid of us now, and then we won't buy it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So maybe we should talk about how to be better at service business. No, I'm kidding. Um, even you know, you and I only running software companies. I still pay for software that run our software companies. But yeah, let's talk about the stuff that I, I've talked about so many times now that I actually forget. It's kind of like second nature now. How do you build software if you're not a developer? Um, I, I have built five software products personally, and I've overseen overseen ten to fifteen products, all created from absolutely nothing, and. What we none of the projects that I worked on. There's never been a situation where the owner actually knew anything about software. Uh, they are all completely clueless, and I think the most that people would know is like maybe they could create an HTML web page, and that was like the most advanced dude that we worked with. Me personally, I'm very scared of software. Um, all of my net worth, I joke, rests on a few single lines of code, um, and and so. Uh, it is it's scary software does scare me and and because it, it scares me because I don't know much about it but this is the beauty uh, that I don't need to and a person in the service space you know where they're like they seek their comfort through becoming an expert in an area for them to not be an expert in an industry that they get into is, is really quite a big big mindset shift really for them um, and in this case what we're doing is hiring developers to build our software for us and I remember my first software project I posted on rentacoder.com and I said, I've never done this before. Uh, I'm not really sure what I'm doing. Uh, I'd like to have a website system that someone could go to and put their contact information in. And then when they're done, it would output a nice, pretty website. Is this possible? How does this work? That was my job posting. And I had like 50 to 50 developers write me like, okay, you need a server that does this. And you need RAM that does this, and you need this domain, so you need these IPs, you need all this stuff. And I'm like, whoa, 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 okay. What does this mean? What is a server? How does this all work? And then the developers started teaching me as I just started asking questions and moving forward. And that's really how, is about as simple as it gets. It's, it's not that complicated. Mm. So basically, you come, I mean, you have to obviously have some sort of idea of, of what you're going to offer. Yes, yes. The idea is the easiest thing. The, that is the easy part. Well, maybe not the easy part. It's easier than you think. Um, so I've come up with, I've maybe done like, let's just say 10 different, I'm 29 now. I started when I was 22. And I've maybe come up with like 10 different businesses in my life. And f- let's say five of them have failed, six of them have failed, and four of them have taken off. And the, uh, 
I don't really fail anymore. I don't have businesses that fail because we've perfected this process that really kind of prevents and, and eliminates failure altogether. And it's coming up with ideas. So all the six ideas that I failed on, Michelle, they were all my ideas. All I thought of, they all failed. The That's four. <laughs> okay. At least you can admit that. And I think to myself, I, I, I mean, I, I, I've, I've done it myself. I failed so many times myself, but it's, it's just made you better at, at what you're going. So, so tell me, these four that have succeeded, these are the ones that came after you failed so many times, right? Yes, and in between. So what are they? <laughs> um, well, I'll tell you what they are. They are um, software in the real estate space. Uh, for real estate companies, and I, I am not passionate about real estate. I don't really care about it. Um, and I, I hear a lot of people talking about, you know, uh, you got to find your passion. And what I've done is I've made my passion the process of simplifying problems for people. Mm. And so I am not passionate about real estate, but I am super passionate about simplifying problems for people. And with that passion of simplifying problems for people, I can go anywhere and do anything. If I make my passion a certain specific niche or industry, I'm like always locked into that and it sucks. And I think I was watching one of your videos and I've been reading a blog post and everything and something that you really touched on with I think is so important in any kind of industry is that you have to solve someone's pain point. And I think mm -hmm. this is the key to finding a really good piece of software or a good software idea is basically uh, finding a pain point. And believe me, when we work with clients, we, we see hundreds of these all the time. So thinking about your clients, thinking about what they need, what could make it better, how, how, how uh, your ideas can make working with them better, and then kind of use that as a seed of thought to, to produce something off the back of that, some piece of software that's going to solve oh. the problem. Oh, holy crap. Yeah. Uh, you know what? I don't think there are very, very many people I can think of that are better positioned or better suited than service professionals to create software. Mm -hmm. So, oh. you know, I mean, you can essentially create something which is going to be a tool to, if, if you work with clients, you can say, okay, uh, I really need this. This is something I really need that would make my life easier working with my clients. Uh, or that would make my life easier working with my team. And then you get this idea and then you just basically go and present it to a developer and then you sell it to all the other service providers out there, <laughs> all your colleagues. <laughs> so that's basically what it is. Yes, so to, 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 let's, let's be specific. Let's use a concrete example so it makes sense. Before I get into the example, and I really haven't answered the question about the foundation, but we can answer that at the, at the end because I think that's the... That'll be the icing on the cake for all of this. Mm -hmm. um, so, if you could build a software business without having an idea, without knowing how to code, and without having to spend any money on the development, and then that software company could go on to double the amount of money you make, would you be interested in doing it? Would be my question for the service providers. Hell yeah. And. <laughs> Hope so, and 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 I want people to understand that it's the limiting beliefs, the limiting beliefs that they have about software that is preventing them from having more freedom and more income as a service professional. They think they need an idea. They think they need to know how to do software, and they think they have to have money. Okay, um, let's just address all three of these through a concrete example. So our most successful student is in New Zealand, and he has built uh, a company. That will that will go. That that is. Uh, it's pretty crazy. Every day now, he is now adding three thousand dollars a year to his income. That's all automated income after he sets it up. So every single day that he works, he's adding three thousand dollars a year to his income. Is this Mr. Owens? And, yes, this is Sam Owens. Okay. And we don't talk about his financial numbers on the interview because we don't want to scare people away because those numbers are pretty big and, and, and sometimes hard to believe. Um, the way he's able to do that is he's signing up like three or four new property management companies to his property inspection software every single day. Now, 
like me, he doesn't really care about property management. But he's super passionate about taking the pain out of people's lives. And by having that as his passion, he's able to go into property management like, all right, where's the pain in your industry and how can I make your life easier? And, and if, you, if you just make that your passion, the world is a playground. This is so much fun. So wh what he did is he contacted property management companies and he said, all right, take me through your day-to-day -day activities. What are the first few things you do when you get into the office every day? Well, I do this, I do this, I do this, and then I do property inspections. Okay, um, of all the things you just mentioned to me, this, 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 and property inspections, which one is the most painful for you? And they're like, oh, wow, um, hmm, I haven't really thought of that. You know, I really don't like property inspections. Property inspections are pretty painful. Oh, okay, well, tell me the process of what, what do you do right now currently to do your property inspections? Like, well, I go into the house. I take photos of each room. I make the mark things on a sheet of paper and then I have to go back down into the office I have to load up Microsoft Word I type out my handwritten notes then I plug in my digital camera to the computer then I pull in the photos and then I can create this property inspection report and Sam's like oh and, and how, how is that process for you oh my gosh it's cumbersome it's tiresome I, I absolutely am miserable while I do it how many of these property inspections do you have to do a day oh man I gotta do them every single day and they take hours He's like, uh, would you like to be rid of having to do that? They're like, yeah, absolutely. Now, Sam asks that question without having any idea what the solution is going to be. He does not know what he's going to build yet. He just knows what the pain is, and he offers them a way out. But just saying, would you like to be rid of that pain if it were possible? Yeah, absolutely. So then he goes back, talks to more property management companies, finds that they all have a similar pain point, and then... He starts documenting down this painful problem they have, and then automatically the subconscious mind starts to come up with a solution. You do not have to think of the idea. Remember this. Do not think of your idea. We have over 1,500 people, probably 1,600 now, all applied to join the foundation to work with me, and we're only going to be accepting 250, okay? So we're very full, and, 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 and these 1,600 people that have applied to work with me are all, you know, I'd say half of them. Oh, wow, there's a really scary spider on the wall. Do you, are you scared of spiders? Yeah, terrified. <laughs> Stays over there. We have 1,500 applicants, and, and I'd say at least 25% of them are all contacting me and being like, Dane, I've got my idea. I'm ready to build my software. It's like, that actually turns me away. Like, I'm like, I actually don't want you to come with any idea of what to build at all. Like, if you have an idea, that's a red flag. Um, so remember, you don't come up with the idea. All you do is idea extraction. All you do is find the pain. If you focus on idea extraction, if you focus on finding the pain, then you will start to come up with all these painful issues. And as you think about them, your subconscious mind will then automatically come up with a solution. In Sam Ovin's case, he's like, oh, wow, why don't we create mobile inspection reports so you can have your, your iPhone, you can take a photo, jot a few notes down, take a photo, jot a few notes down, take a photo, jot a few notes down, and push a button, and then produce your report without ever having to go to your computer. And then the people, the property inspection company is like, oh my gosh. And they, um, he actually ended up having... The next thing, so the first thing we want to reverse for these service, the service folks, and um, I love you all providing services because I work with some every day, and they're amazing. Um, I'm not having anything against anyone in the service industry. I think it's wonderful what they do. The first thing we do is we extract. We, we, we well, the first belief we're reversing here is, oh, my fingers not on the screen, is um, that you have to have an ID. Okay, so would you agree with me, Michelle, that we've now knocked that one off? Yeah, definitely. What we're looking for is just to find out what people's problems are. Yes. Like a therapist. <laughs> yes. Like okay. A Got it. It's so much fun. It's so much fun. The, the, the second thing is, it's so much fun because you can get out of your head and start, oh, what can I come up with? It's like such a stressful question to think of ideas yourself. It's so much fun to get out of your head and just focus on the pain. A great, a, a great place to start as well. I mean, I know that um, Sam, he kind of went into real estate agents, but a great place to start would be your own clients. Yes. Multiple yep. industries <laughs> doing different things. Yes. Mm. Yes. 
Now, on the same point of coming up with the idea, you, know, you have the question, what are your day-to-day tasks and which one's the most painful? You could also ask people, what's the most important activity in your business? That looks like a good idea. I should take a drink too. So you ask people, what's the most important activity in your business? And they'll tell you. You say, do you have any pain associated with that activity? Okay, that's another way to kind of get to the pain. Now, we have like 15 different questions we ask. Um, but it's not about questions. What, what I've learned through teaching this is it's not about the questions. The important thing is what you do after the person answers. Um, so the person's going to answer, um, well, I do this, and then this, and then this, and then property inspections. And I remember what Sam said next, oh, can you rate which one's most painful? So it's really about what you do after you ask the question as opposed to the question itself. So don't ask the question and then expect them to give you a product idea. You're not looking for product ideas. You're looking for pain. When you find pain, then you will end up coming up with a solution. Again, I've taught hundreds of people how to do this, and we've gotten very, very good at it. So these are the best ideas that I currently have on the on the topic. Um, so the first thing is is um, needing an idea. Scratch that. Start with your own clients. Um, you can email them if you want. Not recommended. It's best to do this on the phone. If you have a really high level of rapport, take your five best clients and be like, hey, I'm just curious. What's the most important activity in your business right now? Send just one line email. Hey, I'm just curious. How you um, right now in your business? What's your most important activity? Then just send that. They're going to answer it. Then you reply back. Oh, okay, so the way I understand it is, then you repeat back what they said. Do you have any pain associated with this activity? Okay, so you don't ask two questions in one email. It's just one at a time. Don't, don't overwhelm your don't overwhelm your clients. Um, anyway, so that's that's idea. The second thing is is needing to to, to um, let's talk about getting needing a developer or, or needing to write the software yourself, which means you need money. So let's talk about the two issues of the developer and money. Um, finding a developer is incredibly simple. It's not easy. It's simple. What you want to do is just post a job posting about the painful issue you have. And you don't even really need to have a solution in mind. You say, here's the pain. Does anybody know how we could solve this in the developer space? Um, you go to rentacoder.com, elance.com, odesk.com. These are all viable services. I've used every single one. I've used Odesk and Rentacoder. I've not used Elance. I, I just don't really prefer Elance personally, but they're a good service. I think other people have success with them. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, 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 the thing to remember is not that, oh, I go to Rentacoder and I find developers. The thing to remember is what's the mindset for finding developers? Where do the good developers hang out? Use that to kind of direct your process. So our next step here is finding a developer, and then we'll address how you get the money. So in um, in my case, I typically go to uh, uh, like rent a coder and post a job description and get replies. If I want, if I have money, if I have a little bit of extra money, I hire the best developers I can find. And if I and if I if I want to, well, to find the best developers, I go to different message boards and communities where programmers are hanging out and I find then the top post, the, 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 the people in the message board that have the, the highest number of posts mm-hmm. because the highest number of posts are the most knowledgeable so they're probably really good at what they do and then I private message like ten, the top 10 posters and I usually get one or two hires out of that. Um, so hiring develop, top developer talent is very important. Um, if you have the money, I recommend it. If you don't have the money, here's what you do. Um, in, in the case of Sam Ovens with snapinspect.com, which you can request a full case study at the foundation, he had, he had $5,000 to it in his bank account when he joined the foundation. Like six or seven months later, he has like over $70,000 in the bank now, all because he's applied these mindset things and really cool stuff that we teach. Now, to get, come up with money. What you do is you present your potential solution that's not built yet. It is not built. Uh, to a customer, you say, all right, so I see that pain with property inspections. We're thinking about building an app on the iPhone so you could take photos with it and, and mark it up and then produce a report with a couple clicks. That's all he's talking about, right? Is this something that you that, that you would be interested in? Yes, absolutely. Great. All I ask is that you pay for three months of this product in advance and in exchange will give you 10% off for life. Okay. Dang. Then customer pay three months in advance. 10% off for life. He sold it to 12 people, so he had like three to five grand that he didn't use to invest in building the product. 
That's it. Is that what yep. Sam did? Yep. Awesome. So he sold the product before it even existed. Absolutely. Awesome. So then, so then what happens? You go back to the developer and then you basically say, you let the developer come up with the idea of how it's all going to work based, based on what you say that you needed to do. Yes. And then they make it. And then you sell it. And then you, you sell it to the people who have already bought it. Yes. Okay. So that seems like simple. It seems really simple. It is. Now, there's a few things to watch out for. The first is not all developers are created equal, and some will suggest solutions that make them more money because they want to make money as a developer. So it is important that you're talking to multiple developers at one time, which will give 50 different replies to a good job posting on, say, Recoder. Let's just say you get 10 replies. Oh, I don't know why I'm yawning. I'm not even tired. So you have 10, 10 replies, and then you're talking to multiple ones about how they would... Per you don't actually pick a pay a developer at all until you have kind of a solution finalized. So make sure you're talking to multiple developers because you'll, you'll start to be like, wow, this guy quoted me 400 hours. This guy quoted me 200. What's going on? You know, and so talk to multiple developers. That's something you want to look out for. And also see uh, if you can take a look at what they've done previously, I guess. That'd be a good idea. Yeah. Okay. The big two things that are going to kill your software project are one, the marketing, and second, the developer. Um, <clears throat> now, notice I didn't say the thing that's going to kill your project is the idea or how much money you have. It's the marketing and the developer. Marketing begins with idea extraction. It begins with finding the pain. Most people think of marketing as words on a page to entice someone to, to use your service or product. Um, the higher you go in the marketing mindset spectrum, you start to see that marketing begins with what product is ever created by talking to customers and asking them about their pain. Mm -hmm. So marketing and the developer are the two things that you really want to keep in mind. Um, but this is, a, a, I think, it's probably one of the most fantastical ways. I think service providers would really just kind of silly not to try this. Go on. <laughs> oh, but why silly not to try this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> try what? <laughs> Marketing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I'll try that it. one day. <laughs> oh, you'll try more. Huh. Okay, think, you're breaking uh, up a little bit, so I think I'm like missing bits of the conversation here. <laughs> So basically, um, at the foundation, you, in a, nut, in a nutshell, I think you've just gone through the, the basics of, of how to do this, but obviously it's, it's a lot more um, intensive, I think, than what we've just discussed. So in the foundation, um, so what kind of a program is it that you have that teaches people to do this? Is it online learning? Is it a physical thing? It's an online community. An online community. And, yeah, we have a lot. and basically you you log in online and you work together with your students to to support them in, in what they're trying to achieve full time yeah it's full time for me we work every, I work every day with all the students god it's amazing and um, yeah so basically tell me tell me about the foundation let's let's go on to that now because um you have a really groovy video on your homepage. <laughs> really, really nice video. And it looks like you basically took people out to a lodge or something, and these are all like your students. Do you do that uh, with each group? Yes. Oh, that sounds the yawning. Cool. Um, at the end of every foundation, successful students and us, we all get together and celebrate for a week at a mansion somewhere in the USA. Do you know when you're talking to people or when people apply, do you kind of know the ones who are going to really do well? And, or, or, you know, how do you go through this selection process? I'm getting better at it. 
tri- it's tricky, you know. Like sometimes you think, you know, like as a service provider, you're like, I was going to be a great customer, and you send up like a piece of work, and they start bitching back at you, and they don't pay your bills on time. And you're like, oh man, I thought they'd be so good. So, um, yeah, I can pretty much tell though. Uh, the people that I really like are the ones that have an extremely high level of desire. Um, if they bring desire to the table, uh, we'll provide the rest. Okay. So if anybody wanted to apply for the foundation, how would they go about doing that? They'd want to apply quickly because we're selecting our students on October 4th, I think. i got to check the calendar. Um, but we do the foundation one time a year. So if they don't get accepted this year, there's always next year. And um, maybe a service provider needs a year to really sort through this in their head and actually start to believe that it's possible that they could do it. That's okay, too. Mm-hmm. We're on next year. Um, you know, at the foundation, we have a set of beliefs that guide everything that we do. And we're, we're very particular about these beliefs. They're all very empowering, very exciting, very uplifting beliefs. And we also, this isn't just how to software, like, it's kind of a disservice to, 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 it would be a disservice if that's all we did. Um, what we're doing here is we are creating a community of entrepreneurs who want to eliminate failure from business, reduce risk to almost, and predict the success of a business, predict, predict the success of a product before they ever even get it built, whether it's software or not. This process of idea extraction pitching solution, getting money for it, and then building it is universal for any product. It has nothing to do with software. Um, software just happens to be the vehicle that we use. Um, so we're reinventing education at the foundation. Uh, we are not providing just another message board with a few ebooks and to-do guides. We are creating a ridiculous community. Um, we have a whole, a whole leveling up system. So you can see what level you're at compared to everybody else in the community. Level 10 is when you're going to be making money. Um, you know, And so each, each level, you level up, you get closer and closer. So you can log in and see all the members and what level they're at. And then you can even reach out to different members who are super successful. But then us, as the, 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 our team at the foundation, we go through and we look at the people that are the low levels. And then we're reaching out to them personally. Say, hey, we see your level three. What's going on? What are some limiting beliefs? that you have, why are you stuck, and how can we get you unstuck? So, a, when massive, I say re- a massive part of this is mindset, isn't it? I think, a lot of the time. And you can provide it, all the all the tools, and you can provide all the knowledge and the know-how, but at the end of the day, it's the person that's that's got to make it all happen. Yeah, I'd say it's mindset. Um, but in order, to, in order to catalyze, if you will, change and so on, you have to affect them on the mental, physical, and emotional level. And if you want to, if, if, if we're just talking about mindset, we're missing the physical and emotional level. Now, you know what I'm talking about. You have these beliefs that say, you know, I'm a perfectionist or, um, you know, my business won't run as well without me. Like no one else will do my job as good as me. You know, if you have beliefs like that, you know, logically, that is not true because you know there are amazingly talented people out there on the planet that could do just as good a job as you. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you know that you know, perfection is not really an issue. You know, things can be good enough. You, you know this logically. But emotionally, it, 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 it hasn't taken, taken root. Mm-hmm. And so what we, we actually get in there and, 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 and reverse the, the beliefs uh, on an energetic level so you get the change physically, men- mentally, physically, and emotionally. So mindset is one of the three areas that we, that we address deeply in the foundation. So, so people, we have people that don't even build soft out just incredibly happy because they don't have any limiting beliefs crippling their potential anymore. Do you find that everybody helps each other? You know, the people who are on the higher levels kind of reach out to the people on the lower levels as well and support them? It To a shock. Okay. We have the foundation started right now and we have members that are hanging out in Google Hangouts video chatting like already doing the process of idea extraction helping each other out and the program hasn't even begun yet it's fantastic cool yeah. so I mean people can apply for your program now uh, by going to the foundation.io and uh, if they don't get in for whatever reason I guess you've got a blog as well that they can follow 
um, and they just have to kind of apply next year if uh, if they don't make the cut this year. Yeah, and we have so many applicants this year that a lot of people aren't going to be able to make the cut. You know, we only work with uh, the the best of the best. And when I say best of the best, I'm not talking about people that have the most money or people that are most successful, but people that have just proven through desire and through their application, they'll do, they have anything, they'll do anything that it takes. Those are the kinds of people that we like. We don't discriminate based on if you're successful or not because we want to take we want to take hardest cases. We want to take the most failed, broken people, if you will, and rehabilitate them into successful. We want to take the toughest ones, you know? So, those that don't get, don't get accepted will probably create some sort of free community where they can all still help and commingle. Because this, is, this isn't about being like elite and saying, only this many people can get in. This is just about, I help so many people personally, and the team at the foundation, we can only help so many people personally, so we, we're about impact, then fun, then money. We're not about impact and then fun. We're about impact, fun, and money. So then that Everything we do is aligned with impact. So if you don't accept that the blog is remarkable, we'll probably create a free community for you to to, to connect with other people on. And um, if, 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 if service providers do nothing else, I would just love to see them do idea extraction. Forget about even building software. Maybe people just reply back to the, the questions that a product or an ebook or or a new service you could add on. Just use those questions to to um, create different product lines and different new avenues to, to expand your service company well, software. At, at, the, at the very least, that, that's what I'd love to see uh, your audience do. Fantastic. Now maybe we can sell. Maybe we can sell the ideas to you guys. <laughs> Perfect. Make some money that way. <laughs> Okay, Dane, thank you so much um, for chatting with me today. You've really opened my eyes, my mind, uh, everything. I mean, I, I thought I was a, a true entrepreneur, but you've certainly uh, given me some food for thought there um, in terms of what other things that I could be doing. Before the interview ends, um, do you mind kind of just reflecting back to me a little bit about where your mind's been expanded to and how you thought you were an entrepreneur? Or if you will, like you are an entrepreneur, of course. But. Yeah, definitely. I have. Um, I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I mean, I, I started off as a service provider, and I quickly realized then that I wasn't um, happy providing the services myself. And I felt like uh, whilst I was good at it, I thought I could expand more, have a bigger team, have people working with me to do the services. So that's when I kind of decided to take a step back and thinking to myself that I could actually provide services, but use. The skills of uh, other people um, to help me provide those to clients. Then I wanted to start getting into passive income streams as opposed to just doing consulting and services and that's when I started producing membership sites uh, and I'm all over the place. Products, membership sites, you know, it was all digital. Digital products, digital downloads, this type of thing. Never once in my mind did I consider software. And the, the, the thing that has really opened my mind is that I could probably whack out right now 20 or 30 ideas for really awesome pieces of software just from what I know now, from my daily work, from working with clients, from working with people in different industries, uh, with different problems, because they're constantly coming to me going, Michelle, you know, I really wanna do this. How do I do this online? How do I, you know, and I'm like, mm what would be a great idea would be this, but we've got nothing, we've got no tool that can do that for you. It never occurred to me <laughs> that I could just go to a developer and say, hey, you know, I've just been on a chat with a client and uh, he's wondering how we can do this and I've advised him that this would be a good idea. Can you make it happen? Never occurred to me. Wonderful. Yeah. So now I'm gonna get busy writing down all these ideas. <laughs> and I'm going to be on the phone to you going, oh, what do you think of this? <laughs> oh, right. what's, what's, what's step two? <laughs> step two of what I'm doing, of what to do. Uh, Writing down, what's step two? <clears throat> okay, so I've got my ideas and um, I ask my clients from basically what the problems that they've got, what's their biggest problem? What do they really want to solve? What takes the most time, the most energy? What's keeping them from their family? What's keeping them from earning more money? Uh, then what I'm going to do, because then you ask me the next thing now, <laughs> I'm going to pick the biggest thing, the biggest problem, 
Um, and I also have to kind of work this out in my mind about, you know, because I have one of these minds where uh, I, I, I logicalize everything. Is that even a word? I don't know. But I, I'm very logical about the thinking and about the steps and processes and workflows and, and how we can make this happen. So I would create some sort of a workflow in my mind uh, of how this thing is going to start and, and finish what the steps need to be in order to for them to go through to actually achieve what they want to achieve in this workflow and then i would take it to a developer i think or post on emails i have developers actually in my team i could just go to somebody and say you know what do you think of this so i mean i, I have the resources available to me crazy that i didn't think of this um missing a step it's a what missing one step what am I missing? Now, if we find that you have started to build a product before you've gotten money from a customer, you will be kicked out of the foundation. Seriously, we I thought that was an option though. If you had some money, you could just do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do not. Wasn't that an option? <laughs> okay, so first of all, I would have to go back to my client and say to my client, how much would you give me to, to make this? <laughs> or sell it to them? Yeah, that's good enough. That's a hell of a lot better than not doing it at all. Yeah. I, I, and I suppose, I guess as well, this is, you know, I suppose how naive, naive I am about these type of things is about investing in, in this. It's like, uh, it could all go belly up. And that could be the only client <laughs> that wants it. So it's, I've produced this piece of software and nobody else wants it. Yeah, you wouldn't just sell it to one. You'd be like Sam and sell it to 12. Do you know, I've always had this idea. Um, I, I, I work with so many clients and I use about three or four different systems, which you know I swear by, which all have their place in my business. Um, and all have their place in how I service my clients to work with my team. And I've always thought to myself, wouldn't it be amazing if these four systems were somehow connected together? And I've been trying to use different pieces of software to try and make what I want happen, you know, like pieces of a puzzle. You know, trying to find one piece of software that would bring together these other pieces of software so I didn't have to log in here and go here and blah, blah. And, uh, yeah, that's always been on my mind. And, and I'm so kind of sitting around waiting for someone to do it. Like, you know, come on. <laughs> I've got things to do here and I want this. And uh, it just, yeah, it just really never occurred to me that I could probably go out and make it happen myself. And with the amount of online service providers that I work with, and, and I do training as well, and, you know, I help support other people in, in doing what I'm doing, it just seems crazy to, to have not even considered pursuing it myself. And I, I guess it's just those limited beliefs that you're talking about and this, this kind of limited mindset that you're you're not a software person, so you just sit around waiting for someone else to make it and then they rake in all the money for the idea that you had like, you know, three years ago. <laughs> Excellent. And this is such a painful issue that you could probably get service providers to pay you a few months in advance just by having a conversation with them not even having to show them anything because they can picture how it works that you haven't to show anything. Sure. So you can call 50 service providers and be like, hey, how many systems are you using? What are their names? And how much time do you spend putting data back and forth between them a day? Oh, I spend three hours a day. Hey, would you like me to build a software that talks all, puts all these products together and talks about it? And would you like to be one of the first people on the market to have it so you have an advantage? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Great. If you pay for three months right now, I'll guarantee you one of the first few spots, and I'll give you ten percent off for life. You know what would really scare me though if I did that. Um, I mean, I, I obviously I really care about my reputation, and um, I have quite a large following, and I have quite a good reputation for always being the first person to kind of try something, get their fingers burnt, and then say no, don't do this, but you can do this because this works. And I just I'm so scared if I went down that road and I I came up with an idea and I spoke to a developer and they said yeah we can do this no problem and then the end of it it wasn't how I anticipated it would be like I would have sold a false product you know if I'm selling a product saying it's gonna do this and then at the end of it it didn't quite 
do what I wanted it to do. Uh, you know, and I may have to abandon the project if I didn't have any more money or that would scare me. Mm -hmm. Not having the end product that I promised people and then it's just basically like give your money back and admit defeat, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And what do you think would happen at that point? I think, <laughs> I, I, I don't know really. Um, life would carry on as normal, I suppose. What a, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, what about your reputation? What do you think would happen? What about my what, sorry? Oh, your reputation. What do you think would happen to that? I didn't get that. My foundation. Reputation. Ah, oh, reputation. Um, well, I'd, I'd have to come clean about it and tell people exactly what I was doing and that it didn't work and, and I suppose there would, my reputation would be a fine. <laughs> but, you know, I'm a perfectionist, so... Well, and I've, and I, have a, I'm, I have one deadly sin, it's pride, so I guess that would be pretty damaged, my pride. Why would everything be fine? Well, because I tried it and it didn't work and I, I'd have to go back to my day job, <laughs> providing services. <laughs> what you do right now? Huh? It's already what you do right now. Yes, it's what I do. I mean, I, I do several things. Um, like I say, like I'm an entrepreneur, but it, it's more focused around the service business. It's, I, I have a service business. I work with clients and I, I sell digital products and training programs and online learning. You know, but I, because I can control that, you know, I can control that type of thing. Even though I'm working with other people, even though I have staff and things like that, I'm technically the one that's, you know, driving the ship. Whereas, it, I, and I know my limits and I know my capabilities. Whereas with a piece of software, okay, if it was a, a simple piece of software uh, that could, you know, that people could really wrap their minds around and it just did a simple thing. And believe me, I'm all for simple things because, I mean, I'm constantly browsing the app store looking for new things that are going to make my life easier. And, and sometimes it can be something so, so simple, like an app, you know, and I think that's great. And, you know, and I look at what people are selling apps for, you know, 10 euro, 15 euro, and you think to yourself, okay, well, if we sold this to so many hundreds of people, that's a decent size income. But to me, that's like, Small fry, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> but I, I think what I would have in mind would be something quite complicated. Something brilliant and genius, because I wouldn't settle for anything less, but something quite complicated. So, um, yeah, it would take me some time to wrap my head around it and be brave enough, I suppose, to, to move forward and, and do something like that. I do love what I do. Um, I love providing services. I do it more. I do it more because, um, I mean, I, I like you. I was 23 and I left the UK and um, I went. I decided I wanted to travel the world, but I didn't know how to do it without an income. So that's when I started exploring ways of working online. And uh, then I, I created my company, and it is what it is now. I'm only two years older than you, but you make me feel really old because I'm in the threes now, <laughs> 31. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so basically that's what I did, and I and and on my service providing to me is like a bit of a love affair because it just enabled me to retire at twenty three, I suppose, start my own business, and and it's just it's just what I've always done, seven years. It's just what what I know how to do, and I do it really well. And people come to me to learn from me, to learn how I'm doing what I'm doing. But uh, yeah, software just never never occurred to me but I think I could do it I'm just I'm just a, a real perfectionist and I don't know it would concern me being so new you know when you you know when you you know something and you and it's like an old comfortable pair of shoes and you feel so familiar with it and then you just kind of roll along day by day and you kind of expand and build on what you're already doing and, and this would be totally stepping into a new realm would it be totally new because I've had this idea 
and you know I want to make it happen and I and I know the idea would work because I believe me I know the pain points of my colleagues and the people who work in my industry and um, this has been a massive pain point for me this piece of software that I'm waiting for which never seems to happen so yeah I could make it happen it would just be scary I don't know I would need I would need something definitely something like the foundation nobody can just go and do this on their own and hope for the best which is why what you're doing is awesome thank you <laughs> I heard about four, four limiting beliefs in that last um, six or seven minutes of uh, eloquent rambling Sorry. and I'm very sorry. <laughs> Believe me, when I get started, it's like I'm terrible on interviews because <laughs> the piece of the room is going like, you know, when are you going to shut up? <laughs> no, I'll, and and I completely forgive you. So, thank you. Um, I'll tell you that um, if you sell a product in advance to people and they give you money in advance, I've never ever in my life seen an issue where it actually didn't turn out okay. Um, it's almost in every case it's a, it's turned out okay um, where they give money in advance you know what the the day the product you released you're like all right I've got a product release but you know Michelle I'm a perf or you know I'm Michelle I'm a perfectionist and I'm not happy with how this product works we're gonna have to delay it to, for a month so you go to your customers that have paid you in advance you say hey I want the product to be ready today but I'm just not happy with it yet so it's gonna be one extra month. In exchange for being delayed, I'd be happy to give you a month free when we launch. Okay, now, now this is how you would address a, a delay. Now, all the fears that you mentioned are all completely real and all very legitimate feelings that you have. And it would be wrong for me to say that that's, that that's just not going to happen because there will be things that come up. So those fears are, 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 there is a very real aspect to them. And that is why it's very important to be in the foundation. So you can have this void to go, look, I'm afraid of this. And in the foundation, everyone's completely open and vulnerable with their emotions. It sounds pretty crazy, but it's totally true. Um, we have people come out and say, hey, you know what? I'm feeling very insecure about my product right now. Um, and uh, uh, that's a very real feeling that a lot of entrepreneurs have, but they don't really have the language to, 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 to say, you know, I'm feeling insecure about my product. And so when they come out, they get all this support from the community and support from me and support from the team to help reverse that belief and, and support them in that. With that being said, the universe will never give you something that you cannot handle. I say that all the time. I do. And believe me, the universe is responsible for where I am now. Because I just kind of opened myself up and said, okay, hey, let's do whatever you want and I'll be okay. And it, and it works. I do know it works. But Take that, that thought. The universe will never give you anything you can't handle. And let's apply that to your fear of a perfectionist and fear of a product tanking and a fear of your reputation and a fear of, of things not working out. How, how, how do those two fit together okay yeah I, I do I do see your point um, I guess maybe I just got too comfortable with things with life the way it is I suppose I suppose the best thing to do maybe you're advising against it is to try and think of something small and expensive you know because and as well you have to think to yourself okay say I went to X amount of people and asked for three months in advance payment. So you're talking about selling software, not like a one-off piece of software, but selling it on a recurring basis. Yes. Okay, so it's recurring passive income technically. Oh yeah. Um, there are just so many people out there, like Adobe Business Catalyst, I don't know if you've heard of it, but this piece of software or this online piece of software is just mega and, and I use it in my own business and I think to myself how am I ever going to compete with somebody like Adobe producing uh, these pieces of software where they're, they've got technicians on them like daily every day making them better improving them uh, you know first of all I'd be thinking to myself like how am I going to compete with this with just me and my developer or whatever do you um, want to get I mean, is, are this, is this normal thought process pattern? Yes. Yes. 
Yes, me and my one little developer on one of our products now does $45,000 a month. And it continues to make me $45,000 a month whether I wake up in the morning or not, whether I'm dead or not, whether I do anything or not. Forty-five grand every single month. And I guess that people are subscribing and unsubscribing. Yeah, but we have 15 new people that sign up every month without me having to talk to them. And we have like one person cancel every month. So it just continues to grow like this massive tree. And it's just me and the developer. Because we're competing in a space that Adobe Catalyst doesn't want to compete in because they go after the big markets. We go after, you know, smaller markets that Adobe Catalyst wouldn't even ever enter. But what, I, what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm actually interrupting your flow by just like reversing these, these beliefs that you have right now. Um, all those thoughts are completely legitimate, completely normal, and they're all addressed within the foundation. But you know, and then another thing, sorry, can I ramble again? <laughs> I'll let you go now, Bryce. But um, another thing I was thinking about is like the marketing, and I, and I know that you go through all that uh, in, in the foundation. But you know, it's like, how do you reach a big enough audience to make that amount of money every month? Those, that $45,000 comes from 300 customers. So that's quite a pricey bit of software. Mm -hmm. I suppose it's not really. But even 300 customers, where do you find them? You figure out how to get one customer a day for a year? Okay. They're very bright. <laughs> I've had a before. Software is the easiest thing in the world to sell. If you have any trouble selling your service, trouble selling an ebook, selling a product, they're hardest things in the world to sell. The very simplest thing and easiest thing to sell in the world is software because all you have to do is show people how it works. And they're like, oh yeah, I see how it works. I want to buy it. Like you don't have to like convince anyone. You don't have to have like referrals. Like you don't have to have anyone, can you send me references from three people just to make sure like none of that happens. Like software is the simplest thing in the world to sell. It's, it's a win, every single category. Okay, maybe I should apply for your foundation. <laughs> You're trying to get me on here to apply, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> I'm gonna pick you up as a customer. <laughs> okay, um, no, this has, been, this has been cool. I'm really enlightening. And maybe I'll, maybe I'll take a new career path now. No, not a new one, a sideline. There you go. <laughs>